It's nice to see you all here. Um, I'm Anna Heller, the Bruce A. Beal Director of the Cornell Fine Arts, and I am delighted to introduce tonight's speaker um, and our last lecture of this season in the series of Dialogues with Collectors. So before um, I introduce our speaker, I want to acknowledge the Thomas P. Johnson Distinguished Visiting Scholars Fund, uh, which generously funds all our lectures in this series. Um, now, it's so nice to see so many of you here tonight, and you're in for a very special treat. Um, it is my very distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Gary Vikan, who's not only a noted scholar and national arts leader, um, but also a personal friend and mentor. Um, and uh, I am very thankful that he made it all the way to Orlando to come share uh, some of his knowledge with us. Uh, Dr. Vikan uh, was trained as a Byzantinist and began his uh, scholarly career at Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, D.C., and then held a number of curatorial positions at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore until he assumed the directorship of that museum in 1994, a position which he held until last year. Um, he's also a professor at Johns Hopkins University um, in the department, an adjunct in the Department of Art History and a faculty member in the School of Continuing Studies and has published and lectured extensively on topics as varied as early Christian pilgrimage, medicine and magic, icons, the Shroud of Turin, personal favorite, neuroscience and aesthetics, and Elvis Presley. Actually, his most recent book, which I recommend very highly, which was published last year in 2012, is titled From the Holy Land to Graceland, Sacred People, Places, and Things in Our Lives. And I, although even I admit that not a whole lot of art history reading is really fun, this one is. Um, at the Walters, Dr. Vikan uh, curated a number of the most significant exhibitions uh, that that museum ever organized, including Silver Treasure from Early Byzantium in 1986, Holy Image, Holy Space, Frescoes and Icons from Greece in 1988, Gates of Mystery, The Art of Holy Russia in 92, and African Zion, The Sacred Art of Ethiopia, which was really quite uh, culture-making um, in 1993. Uh, during his tenure as a director, he was a driving force between, bef behind, rather, behind the renovation of the Center Street building in 2001 and um, con the contextual reinstallation of a number of the Walters' very prestigious collections, including the ancient, medieval, and 19th century collections, and later on in 2005, the uh, Renaissance and Baroque uh, collections in the Charles Street building. Um, under his leadership, the uh, Walters received Mellon Foundation Challenge Grants to endow six curatorial positions, two curatorial postdoctoral positions, and a conservation scientist. And it, it, the, the Walters during his tenure changed much more than its name. Uh, there was a, 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 big, um, a big event at one point when the Walters Gallery became the Walters Art Museum, but I think that the Walters changed much more than its name, and it became really it, the reputation of the museum as one of the premier uh, institutions in our country for innovative exhibitions and um, installation of the collections, which is so, you know, sometimes neglected in, in our museums. Um, it really grew exponentially. And, and speaking about the collection, the collection itself, and this brings us to the topic of tonight's conversation, the collection grew significantly during Dr. Vikan's tenure. Uh, he added three major collections to the holdings of the Walters, the John and Berth Ford Collection of the Arts of India, Nepal, and Tibet, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation Collection of Southeast Asian Art, and the John Byrne Collection of the Arts of the Ancient America. And connected with on the heels of the Art of Zion exhibition, he also built the finest collection of Ethiopian art outside of its country of origin at, at the Walters. So it is about collecting and, and the extraordinary collection of the Walters Art Museum and, and his, his role in it that he will talk to us tonight in his talk titled The Walters, Story of Great Collectors and a Great Collection. So please help me welcome Dr. Gar Gary Vikan. So, um, yeah, I almost didn't make it. You know, there are five flights that leave from Baltimore in the afternoon, in one afternoon, to come to Orlando, and they were all late. But I'm here. It's my first time 
And as warm as it is in Baltimore, namely 50, it's wonderfully fresh here. And walking on your campus in the dark is a real treat. So uh, Anna and I share three things in common. One is that we believe in giving the spiritual meaning to art that art asks for. Two, uh, we are museum directors, or I used to be one. And three, which you don't know, we share Romania in common. She comes from there, I was there for a year when she was probably in grade school. So anyway, I'm here today to talk about the Walters. It has three sections, and then you get to talk back. You can talk back anytime you want. You know, I think the internet has sort of changed things. You expect to be heard, and you should be heard. After all, you came out tonight. Uh, so if you have a thought, or if I'm not making sense, uh, stop me. But it has three sections. The first is a history of the Walters as a collection. Uh, the second uh, is some things we did, as when I was director of the Walters, to change it a little bit. And the third part are adventures and misadventures I had in expanding the collection. I'm writing my memoirs now, but that's much too fancy a word. I, work, I watched the movie All About Eve. How many have seen that movie within the last 30 years? Come on. <laughs> All about Eve, and there's a certain point where the playwright figures out that uh, Eve is lying and when she can't remember the theater in San Francisco where she supposedly saw Betty Davis. And she says, it's funny what you remember and what you forget. So my memoirs are titled, It's Funny, What I Remember and What I Forget. <laughs> So I've just started, I'm on chapter two, and you'll get a little flavor of that. The Walters Art Museum in downtown Baltimore, how many have been there? Well, that's gratifying. I recognize some of you. <laughs> that's what I loved, I love to walk the floor, I love to pick up little bits of trash. It's only a museum director does that. You know, when the fountain doesn't work and it's not been cleaned, it's like your home, and you feel very close to it. So you've got a very good person to take care of your home, by the way. I think I can say that. I've known Anna for a long time. Well, the Walters' main inca incarnation is this wonderful Beaux-Arts building on the corner of Center and, uh, Center and Charles Street in downtown Baltimore. It was opened in 1909, but really not open because it was a private gallery for the first 1909 to 1934 before it became a public institution. Uh, and its collection is spectacular. 22,000 works of art when it opened in 1934. It is the second finest collection of medieval art, the second finest collection of ancient art in the United States, the second finest collection of medieval illuminated manuscripts in the United States, the best collection of any museum for historical jewelry in the United States. And there it is in Baltimore, a quiet little place, and we tried to make it uh, the best museum we possibly could. It all began with a guy in the middle there, William T. Walters, who was born in 1819 in Pennsylvania. He came to Baltimore in his upper 20s. He got in the liquor business right away. Not a distiller, but a bottler of rye whiskey. And if you're really lucky and collect bottles with liquor still in them, you can get one for about $2,000 from 1857 or so. They come up every now and then. But his mother told him two things. One that looking at art made you a better person, and two, that every city needed art. So by the time he was in his 20s, he was buying art that was significant. And I mean significant not only by who made it, Asher Durand, one of the great Hudson River School painters, how much he paid for it, $1,500 in 1857. If you compound that at 5%, it's more than the lady in Crystal Bridges in Arkansas is paying for an Asher Durand nowadays, namely 28 million. But what was really revealing, the guy was 38 years old, in the liquor business, just having moved to the fancy part of town, Mount Vernon Place, with two preteens and a young wife, and he buys a painting that's too big for his house. That tells you a lot about what he intended. He is very publicly minded. So art was good for you, that's what his mother said. Every city should have art. Baltimore was a third largest city in the United States in the second quarter of the 19th century, fastest growing city in the United States in the second quarter of the 19th century, and it had no art collection. So that was his job. 
He collected Hudson River School. The Walters and Baltimore is south of the Mason-Dixon line, which you probably knew. It's a southern state, and he was a southern sympathizer. In fact, his brother was arrested as a spy for the South. So he skedaddled, and I'm quoting now from the minutes of the Maryland Club, when he tried to get in in 1867. Maryland Club still exists. Same building, very Baltimore story. They debated long and hard whether or not one of the most successful people in Baltimore would get into the Maryland Club in 1867 because he did two things that were wrong. He was a liquor merchant, which wasn't a good idea from their point of view, and he skedaddled, and that's a quote. He left Baltimore for Paris. He sat out the Civil War in Paris. And he discovered French artists, and he went to the studio of Ang, who was in his 80s, and Delacroix, who was an old man as well, and Daumier. And he decided they were much better than the Hudson River School painters, so he sold everything he possibly could. He couldn't sell the Asher Durand because he couldn't get the price he wanted for it. So he still kept some American painters, not because he wanted to, but because he couldn't get rid of them. And he bought French art. And he bought very good French art, but he liked French art that told a story, ideally from the Bible, because he was a very religious person, or from classical antiquity with a moralizing tale. He did not like naked people. There's very little naked art in the Walters. So he came back from the Civil War, and in the late 1860s, decided he just loved Asian decorative arts, and he started to buy. At the fair in Philadelphia in 1876, he was the largest buyer, by 260 some odd pieces. So when he died in 1894 in the house where he moved in as a liquor merchant in his 30s on Mount Vernon Place, he died at the age of 75, walked up the steps, stumbled, went upstairs, ordered terrapin soup. Have you ever had terrapin soup? Turtle soup, bad idea. He expired. He had a son that was 46 years old. Dad died at the age of 75. He died with 7,000 works of art. This was about 400 paintings, and the balance were decorative arts, like the ceramic, the Chinese ceramic you see at the right. He started his museum in his house, when his house no longer contained everything he had, because it was a smallish townhouse. He tore down the carriage houses be be behind the townhouse and built a teeny little museum. He let people come in in the springtime. He asked them for a quarter. The quarter went to the Children's Relief Fund. So he gave the money away. So it was sort of a public museum, but it was a private museum as well. And every year, just about this time, he would walk through his museum in his house and make choices. Things that he didn't like so much anymore came down. Things that he liked more went up and he re rearranged things. So as I say, he died with a 46-year-old son named Henry. William was a father, Henry was a son. Henry had gone to a very fancy boarding school, but had no identity. He learned by this time the railroad business because dad took the railroad business into the banking business and from the banking business out of the liquor business into the banking business and the banking business into the railroad business. And they made their fortune ultimately with the Atlantic Coast Line Railroad so they partnered with um, Henry Flagler, and they had railroads that went all the way to Miami and all the way to Knoxville. So it was one of those great railroads that's on the Monopoly board. And so when he died, as I say, 7,000 works of art, he was 75 years old. His son had no identity, except he was a very good businessman running the railroad company out of Wilmington, North Carolina. And his son started to collect. And unlike the father, who collected in only two areas, French academic painting. Realize the father died 20 years after the first Impressionist show. He didn't like Impressionist artists. I don't think he liked the people who bought Impressionist artists. The son didn't either. He lived until he was into 1931. He lived to the age of 83. And the son bought everything from little golden purses from Etruria, 6th century BC all the way up to Fabergé. But he didn't buy Impressionist art. He bought the greatest sarcophagi that Rome could cough up, and he bought the whole collection of elite jewelry in the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. He bought the whole case. He bought a total of 15,000 works of art covering five millennia, 
from five continents, spending as much as a million dollars in one purchase in 1902. One million dollars in 1902 is 110 million dollars in 2013. He got 1,740 works of art for one million dollars in 1902. Went all the way from ancient Egypt all the way up to Tiepolo. So he had to commission his own ship to bring it all back to Baltimore. And he collected, and he collected, and he didn't get married until he was 72 years old. He had a yacht that was 225 feet long. He lived in New York City. He belonged to 30 clubs. He lived with Mr. and Mrs. Um, he lived with another couple in a house in New York. And when Mr. died, Pembroke Jones died, in 1819, Mr. Walters moved out. And if you want to go to that house now, go to Hotel Pierre, go in the front door, go down the hall and take a left and go out the side door. Look across 61st Street, realizing that the Metropolitan Club is one block south, he belonged to that one. The Knickerbocker Club is one block north, he belonged to that one. The Knickerbocker Club was designed by the same person who did his art museum. It was very convenient. You look at Right over there would have been 1361st Street at the southeast corner of Central Park. You know what you're going to see? The down ramp for the underground parking for Barney's department store. What I'm telling you is the house doesn't survive anymore. But that's where he lived, with his couple. And Mr. Pembroke Jones died, and Sadie was still living. So he moved down to the Belmont Hotel. Three years later, on the 9th of April, 1922, he's 72, she's 63. They eloped. She had two children. One was named Pembroke and one was named Sadie. The kids were named after the parents. The daughter had been married, got married. The husband of the daughter was John Russell Pope, the architect of the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. So it's a small world. He belonged to the 400 of the Gilded Age, collected, as I say, uh, 22,000 works of art. There are, there are no Walters walking around the world nowadays because he had no children. Uh, and when he died in 1931, he lived in New York and nobody knew exactly what was going to happen to the collection. He didn't come down to Baltimore very often. His museum, quote unquote, museum opened in 1909, but in fact it wasn't a public museum. In the springtime people could come in just as they had for Dad's museum when it was a house museum 40 years earlier. Uh, but uh, he didn't come down very often. He died at the age of 83 in his house in New York City. They opened the will. He died on the 30th of November, my birthday. The will was probated on the 6th of December. They opened it up, and they found out he'd written it the day he got married, himself, in his own hand. Yes, you know why. <laughs> Mrs. Jones liked to spend money. And the only thing she got her hands on was a house on 61st and 5th, and what was still in the house. 15,000 works that he collected and 7,000 his father collected, 22,000 works of art covering everything from ancient Egypt to Fabergé went to the city of Baltimore for the benefit of the public. The largest single act of art philanthropy in the history of the United States. Good place. So there it was, HW, we still have a few crates with locks with no keys. We had to, we had to bust them open. It uh, didn't have any art in it, but when he died, there were 243 crates in the Walters that hadn't been opened. He had one employee who was both the head of security, the head of conservation, and the chief curator. And what that person did was to open the boxes, check them against the manifold, manifest, I should say, close the boxes and seal them. So when he died, there were 243 crates yet to be opened, one of which, actually two, had the same thing written on the outside. They were smaller, much smaller than the other ones. Egg, Russian, modern. In the last year of his life, he bought two Imperial Fabergé eggs, one of which is on the screen right now. So that set the course for the Walters. 22,000 works of art that Baltimore City had. They had this Beaux-Arts building on the corner with huge bronze doors, and nobody had been behind those bronze doors except in the springtime. And the ley lights, there were no ley lights up there because they'd put canvas. Baltimore's a hot place in the summertime. 
and there was no air conditioning, so they put canvas over the, over the glass ceiling. So you can imagine what it was like in there. Boxes in crates, and it was dark. And the mayor of the city of Baltimore all of a sudden had this building, had the house, and had $4 million endowment. What to do? What to do? They hired three conservators to make sure the stuff didn't fall apart, and five curators. The five curators were all hired on two-year contracts to catalog that portion of 22,000 works that was within their domain of expertise. One finished the job in 18 years. The other four died with their boots on. And by that I mean they never finished, and they ended their days as curators at the Walters Art Gallery. I met them all. None of them is still living, of course. So that set the course for the Walters. You had to have people that knew art history because they didn't know what they had. They had to have conservators because it was all falling apart. That was a collection totally different from Cleveland. Cleveland is 100 years old this year as an art museum, and every work in the Cleveland Museum of Art was picked by a curator and discussed with other curators and with the funders. The total collection of the National Gallery in London is 2,000 works. There's virtually nothing in storage. 85% of what Henry Walters and his father bought is in storage. When it was taken over by the city of Baltimore, they had no idea what they had. And now, after how many, 80 some odd years, we still are finding out things. And for the most part, it's all good news. So it set the course for conservation. We have one of the great conservation, an old and wonderful conservation labs in the country for a relatively small museum. We have a staff of 100, I say we, I retired. We have a staff of 150 and a budget of about $15 million. So it's a small museum. It's probably 40 down from the top with the Met at the top, 10 times the size of the Walters. And curators, we have a very high proportion of PhDs at the Walters, not because we value them in and of themselves, but the collection demands it. When you have so many Greek manuscripts, Armenian manuscripts, so much Latin stuff, so many inscriptions, it is a very academic place. So, uh, when I came to the Walters, our mission was to preserve, enhance, and foster understanding of the collection. Preserve means to take care of it, that's conservation. Enhance means to get more of it. And foster understanding is a kind of um, teachy little term that you know, you're going to help people figure out what you've got, right? So it seemed to me at the time, since I always thought, and I was brought up on John Dewey and a very populist notion of what art was all about as a, as a kind of piece of social fabric and as an experience that provides a kind of salutary outcome. And I inherited that from John Dewey and from William T. Walters uh, and through him from his mother, that we changed our mission. I didn't do it, the trustees did, but it was certainly consistent with my values and perspective. So we took the, efforts, the emphasis off the thing and put the emphasis on the who interacting with the thing. So what really we measure our value by is the point of intersection between what you have and what you do for somebody as they encounter what you have. And once we did that, it changed really the course of what the museum was all about. It took some time. But it had a whole lot to do with how we show art. And I think more than any other museum in the country that's encyclopedic, and by that I mean a museum that actually covers most of the bases of Art 101. You can do Art 101 at the Walters. Uh, it's not A-plus pieces. You have to go to the Met or Dumbarton Oaks or the Louvre or the Cairo Museum for that. But the Walters has a whole lot of B-plus. So it's sort of like a decathlon athlete. When you add them all up, it's an extraordinary collection. Extraordinary collection. But it was very dry and very distant. And we wanted to give it life. And we wanted to kind of get a sense that if somebody were locked in the building, that was my criterion, if you were locked in the building overnight, you couldn't get out. If those magical metal doors came down, kaplunk, and you clawed on the inside of them. And you pleaded to the camera, and nobody would let you out. And you had nothing to do until 9 o'clock the next morning. Of course, this 
would never happen, but let's say it did, that you could walk around the museum, and let's say you couldn't even read English. You had no benefit of the labels. Your experience would not be so different from walking into Chartres Cathedral. You know, when you walk into Chartres Cathedral, you don't turn to your right and read a label. And most people don't pay $12.50, or whatever it costs at the Met, to get a headset. You are overtaken by the experience. And I wanted the Walters in a bunch of small snippets to create an experiential totality, such that if you were locked in there and you couldn't read the labels, you could make sense of it. Now that's a little tough. When everything in the Walters, 22,000 works were bought, I'm going to kind of paraphrase the buying situation, with Henry Walters sitting on one side of a oak desk and Mr. Kevorkian, because that was one of his major dealers, an Armenian from Persia, selling Egyptian art, if you can connect those dots, sitting on the other side and passing a little black leather box across the table, and Walter's opening this black leather box and finding an Etruscan bronze inside, encounter some how it was done. And on the outside, embossed in golden letters, would be something like, in Roman numerals, 6th century BC, which it may or may not have been. But that was totally an orphan. They had no idea where it came from. So you have 22,000 orphans and no family. Does that make sense? So I decided I'd make some families. And I say me, I mean it was all of us that did this, the curators and the educators, the whole shebang. So we had this mummy. It wasn't even a Walter's mummy. He, was, he found them sort of creepy. We had to get this one for the Met in the 40s. So we took the mummy. He had the canopic jars. Walter's bought those. He also had the Schwapte box. He bought those. Three didn't go together, but we put them together. So that instead of seeing that thing, you see that thing. And it's not magic, but we did it everywhere. And because we have so much religious art at the Walters, we have six altars. Six altars. The first is 6th century, the last one is 17th century. But they're all religiously accurate. And a couple have had uh, liturgy performed at them. So people take them seriously. And the nth degree of contextual installation, we did our Cabinet of Wonders, which opened in 2005. And actually the photograph is taken with an 18-foot alligator right over the top of your head. And it was shot by one of our trustees, as he said, in self-defense. Shot the alligator in self-defense. I mean, he flew to Florida to go alligator hunting. You know, he could have stayed in Baltimore. It's not as if, you know, it snuck up on him in the toilet or anything. But what I'm telling you is there's an alligator right over your head, and the whole thing is accurate to 1640. Everything in this room is knowable, including that moose, and gettable from somebody in the Netherlands with a cabinet of wonders, with the notion that if you look carefully at what man has made and what God has made, you can figure out the world. And so we have a case of butterflies, all of which came by eBay, appropriately, and all of which were paid for by little kids, because they're pretty cheap. And so this is where the Walters went. Well, where else did it take us? We eliminated our entry fee in 2006, and yes, you can do that. Average museum, maybe 4% of the revenue is represented by admissions. So if I were a trustee someplace, I might suggest to the staff if they took a pay cut. <laughs> no, that wouldn't go very far. <laughs> but it was interesting when Chicago's attendance fell, the Art Institute, what did they do? They raised the entry fee to $23. You don't have to do that. We didn't do that. Attendance went up 45%. Minority participation, Baltimore, 65% African American. Minority participation went up by a factor of three. Entry fee counts. Not only because it's real money for real people who are paying to park and paying to have lunch, and there are families involved, grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, the kids always got in free. 
but because it sends a message to everybody that this collection belongs to you. And we came back again and again to one basic statement, for the benefit of the public. This collection exists for the benefit of the public. And we exist as staff not because of the stuff we have, but what we do with the stuff that we're entrusted with. So that culture change was very pervasive. And so when it came time to digitize our collection, we were one of four museums in the country that gives away, with no expectation of any return, high-density, high digitized image of the entire collection for anybody who wants it. Take a look at Walter's online collection. Superb photographs, 118 megabytes for the TIFFs. And you can have them anywhere. We've digitized our manuscript collection, probably about close to 300,000 images now, free to anybody in the world that wants them. Any day, 8 million people see, see a Walters object on Wikipedia because we uploaded through Wikimedia 22,000 images, which means if somebody's illustrating a classical piece of classical mythology and they want a picture in that entry, they can take ours. They can go to the shelf in a high-quality image of a high-quality object with no encumbrance on how it's used. So 200,000 people visit the Walters with their feet. Eight million people a day will see an image from the Walters on Wikipedia. Okay, so that's sort of what we did. Uh, the collection, that's what I inherited when we got there. The collection was so big and the building was so small. And there's a second museum in Baltimore called the uh, Baltimore Museum of Art that the thinking was that all the new stuff, all the new buying, all the new gifting should go to the Baltimore Museum of Art. And until the 1980s, that's pretty much what happened. They were founded in 1914. The Walters opened to the public in 1934, three years after Henry Walters died. So for the first 50 years of the Walters' existence, virtually nothing came into the collection. We had no money to buy anything because we had too much. If you show 15%, we have more Gothic ivories. We have more French books of ours than Paris, than all the collections in Paris. So why buy anything else, right? Well, there are things we didn't have and we could have. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the people I met, most of whom were very nice, some of whom were not. These were among the nicest people I ever met an immensely successful African-American financier, um, Brown Capital Management in Baltimore. Eddie Brown on the right, a legendary figure not only in Baltimore but nationally in terms of his own success. He was brought up by his aunt. He was an orphan uh, driving a truck when he was 15 years old. And now he's one of the wealthiest people in the Baltimore region. And much more important than that, he's one of the most uh, philanthropically sensitive people in the Baltimore region. He's done more for more places in the last 15 years than any other philanthropist in the Baltimore metropolitan area, and that's with his wife. So I called him and said, well, Henry Walters, when he bought art of the 19th century, did not buy any art by African-American artists. He would have. There's no reason he wouldn't have. He just didn't. And there are five that we would like to have, five artists we should have represented. Eddie, would you give me 500,000 if I raised 500,000 from other people? He said, yeah, it took about that long. So we had a pot of a million dollars. It took us 12, almost 12 years to spend it all. One of the first things we bought were uh, this Tanner, because Tanner's father was a Baltimore preacher. Uh, so Tanner's usually associated with Philadelphia, but Baltimore is a very strong tie. And the last painting we bought just about Half a year ago, it was a Duncanson. So we spent our million dollars, got five works, and they are part of our 19th century collection. And we all owe that to Eddie and Sylvia Brown. That was very easy. It was also very easy to get the John and Barrett Ford collection, which Anna referenced. John Ford uh, was an interior designer in Baltimore. He never made much money but he had a passionate interest in the arts of India, Nepal, and Tibet. And he bought wisely, sold wisely, traded up, and put together a superb collection. And I was sitting with him in what 
was the cafe at the Walters, which was quite nice. We had a white tablecloth cafe, and I'd been director for four years, and I was sitting with John Ford, well, back there. And I said to John, in a way that a beginning museum director can say, why don't you give us your collection? He said, you have no place to put it. And I said, I'll get rid of the cafe. That was that simple. The cafe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible gallery, <laughs> but we got the collection. And it's a very good collection. John and Bert Ford, uh, sweet, interesting, wonderful people. About five years later, I get a call from Sotheby's. And they say, we were going to auction off Doris Duke's collection in their Somerville, New Jersey mansion. Has anybody been to Somerville, New Jersey and Doris Duke's mansion in Somerville, New Jersey on the grounds that's populated by geese and deer? A spectacular 1920 house uh, by Hastings where she lived some of the time. She also lived in Honolulu some of the time at Shangri-La. Anyway, this house was filled with the arts of mostly Tibet, but also Burma, Khmer material, South Asia, Southeast Asia. And the estate was going to sell it. This collection is too good. You shouldn't do that. And they asked somebody, well, who should get it? Who should have a choice of this collection? He said two museums, the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore and the Asian Museum in San Francisco. So we went up to her house, which was totally empty, walked through all the rooms, including the shooting gallery with cork walls and those little clay pipe things at the end, you know. For entertainment at night, maybe during the day, they would shoot 22s in the house. Doris Duke and her friends. It was interesting to see the cork walls. The room was probably 30 feet long and maybe 10 feet wide. There were bullet holes like there and there. I think this was after dinner shooting. She also had two tennis courts. There were clay courts and there was a hurricane and it flooded this deep. And so you could still see the footprints in the, in the mud in, the, in 2002 when we were there and the occasional dead rat, and these spectacular Thai lacquer chests. She had nine of them. And they still had the watermarks up to here. They hadn't been touched. This Guan Yin was her favorite work. It was right in the middle of a long, narrow house. And we had our choice. So the curator and I went through this house, it wasn't heated, and the carriage house, which was truly a carriage house because it was huge before cars. And it was spectacular stuff, including a Thai pavilion, which we were gonna put to get back together again and turn into a cafe, but we couldn't figure out how to put it together. So San Francisco did the same thing. So how do you think we figured out what to do? How do you think we decided who was gonna get what? exactly what happened. We got on the telephone in Baltimore, they got on the telephone in San Francisco, we had our list, we did the coin toss. They trusted us. We won, and we started with a mid-19th century spectacular Thai manuscript and went for 250 objects each, nonstop, until the collection was divvied up. That was Doris Duke, I never met her. Um, her house, guy got 93 million dollars so I started with liquor moved up to banking and railroads now we're back to tobacco now this is totally the opposite you heard that we had the fine have the finest collection of Ethiopian art outside of Ethiopia you've probably never seen Ethiopian art Christian art it, it, you know, Ethiopia was the first national identity in the world to convert to Christianity and express it on their coinage, second quarter of the fourth century. Constantine the Great in Rome, Georgia, 
Armenia, and Ethiopia, all converted to Christianity in one generation. Ethiopia was the first to put the cross on its coinage. So it's been a Christian country for 1,600 years. They made spectacular icons, which have qualities of Matisse, qualities of uh, an Italian 15th century painter, and qualities of Byzantium. And we were going to collect them. Actually, we didn't want to collect them. We wanted to show them. And that is the Abuna, the Abuna Pavlos. And in Ethiopia, in all Orthodox lands, there is a patriarch, the equivalent of the Pope in Catholicism. There are 15, and none reports to the other. So the Abuna was coming to welcome an exhibition from Addis that we did at the Walters. And he, at the exhibition was opening on a Friday. And by Tuesday, we'd received 63 threats against his life at our switchboard. Now, why was that? Because he belonged to one segment. You may remember there are, the, there are Tigrayans and Amarans in Ethiopia. He belonged to one group, and the president and who backed him had killed a number of people. And there was such suppression in Ethiopia that it got on page 29 of the New York Times. But once he came to the United States, it was all acted out. So we're opening the exhibition on Saturday. The Abuna was coming from Ethiopia at our expense to be there for the opening. He'd already been in New York. Rocks and eggs were thrown. He had already been in Washington. And they decided not to continue his tour because there were so many protests. So he came to the Walters for the opening. And in those days, we used to get 2,000 people at an opening. Everything was ready. It was Saturday night. And he came to the museum, and I said to him, well, with all these threats against your life, I'm going to have to ask you to leave before all these people come in. We don't even have metal detectors. And he walked me into the auditorium, and his bodyguard pointed to the ground, and he said, I would rather have my blood on the floor of your auditorium than have the Abuna insulted by the Walters Art Gallery. Somebody goes like this, says, you have a phone call. This was before cell phones. It was 1993. So I got onto the pay phone at the front entry of the museum. While the Abuna and his bodyguard are in the auditorium looking at the carpet, there are 2,000 people out on the street with bags, many of them with bags that, you know, uh, laundry bags, bags from grocery stores. And there, you can see that there's something heavy in them. There's three television stations by this time outside. So there are 2,000 Walters members waiting to come in at 7 o'clock, three TV stations, a bunch of Ethiopians who hate this guy. I went to college with him. We were at Princeton together. I thought I could reason with him. I thought he would go home at 6.30. No. He and his 16 helpers tell me they're not going to leave until I apologize. Apologize for what? And then this thing. How many said you got a phone call at the pay phone at the front of the museum? I go down there. I'm sitting on one of these metal ashtrays, you know. Pick up the phone. He says, hello. He says, is this Vicon? I pronounce it Vicon. Is this Vicon? I said, yes. This is the Ethiopian ambassador. I said, oh, yeah, it's nice, nice to hear from you. He says, I consider any threat against the Abuna, Abuna is Ethiopian for Pope, an insult to our nation, and I hold you personally responsible. The guy never met me. So I've got the ambassador on the phone telling me that I've insulted Ethiopia. I've got the Pope from Ethiopia in the auditorium staking out where his blood is going to be on the ground. I've got another 15 Ethiopians in tall black hats sitting in front of a podium waiting for me to apologize. And I got a policeman in there, a Baltimore City policeman. And he has a nightstick. And you can imagine these 16 guys in black 
There are only about six staff in there. I had just become director. The cop says to me, he's got his nightstick. He says, he's tapping it in his hand. He says, do you want me to? I said, no. This is the Pope of Ethiopia. See all those people, because the doors were glass. So all these people outside, including the television people, are watching us inside the building. So I sent our, our head of public relations, I says, get a big piece of white paper and a magic marker. Is that so hard? Couldn't find either the paper or the magic marker. Finally did, it says canceled. Members go home and put it on the window. At that point, I said, the only way that guy's going to leave is for me not to tell him where the bathroom is. <laughs> he says, you have to apologize, and it has to be on television. So I got our PR guy. We had one of those old-fashioned cameras, you know, those, those recorder things, those H, you know, beta, whatever the heck they were. Yeah. I wasn't going to apologize to this guy. So I got somebody else to get up at the podium, and I got a PR guy with a cop at the back with this thing, taking movies of somebody else saying something to the Abuna and his 16 helpers in these stovepipe black hats, put the sign outside, three television stations. The minute the sign goes up, all 16 people, men, get up, go to the elevator, get on the freight elevator, go up to the second floor, walk through the building, go out the back door, get in a van. The van goes up the street, past the three TV stations, past 2,000 people who had no idea they were in there, and drove away to Washington, D.C. They were gone. It was all canceled. So I went outside, did some interviews, met some of the people, walking back to my car. I heard all this noise inside the museum. We'd hired a band. We paid for the food. There were 12 staff in there having the opening. I went all to that guy. We ended up buying the art that was in the show three years later. And I don't think we ever would without the help of the Abuna. This is a CIA guy. He lives in Baltimore. We don't say that to his face, but everybody knows he was in the CIA. Physician. He was recruited to be the last, or the physician, to the last sheikh of Yemen. It was in 1963. And he lived in a, in a small town in Yemen. It's not Sana. It was outside of Sana where the sheikh lived. And the sheikh liked him so much that he said, take your pick of all the art you want. Well, the sheikh was murdered. This guy. Jerome Foster, left in a hurry with his wife, Carol. They got out of the country, didn't take any of the art with him. 1971, six years later, he's in London. It's up at auction. He buys it back. It's in his house in Baltimore from the early 70s until 2010. I get a letter in the summertime, typewritten, old-fashioned letter, and it says, I want to give you my art from, Ethiopia, from Yemen. And it's all alabaster. It's quite wonderful. Nobody has any of it. Now we have 55 pieces, thanks to Jerome Foster. See that piece right there, right above my finger? Can you see that lady there, that kind of naked lady? Nod, somebody, if you see what I'm talking about. See that lady above my finger, that naked lady? It's the same lady. She's on their money. <laughs> what do you think I did? What do you think I did? The guy's offering me, in fact, two works in his collection were so famous, they, were, they are to this day on Yemen money and stamps. What would you do? I mean, what would you do? You could tell him I don't want it? You could tell him you should give it back? Yeah. Well, whose decision is that? 
make a copy and keep it wouldn't have been so hard. We could have done that. What would you do? What would you do? If you were a museum director, you get that thing, and I knew it. I'd been to his house. I'd seen that. I don't know how much money that is. It's not a very good engraving. This is quite a wonderful piece. It's one of 55 pieces he gave us. CIA. No. <laughs> I wanted it. I wanted to have this thing. Come on, get with the program here. The idea is to get more stuff. What? Yeah, he bought it at auction. He bought it back. I suppose you could say that if I were somebody in, in Yemen right now, I could say, well, that sheikh who was murdered in the coup, which was part of the revolution against that evil regime, didn't have the right to give this away, and even if it did, it's so important to our national heritage, you ought to give it back. I could say that. I could have just put it out and, you know, hid under the table for three years, as I did with the Abuna, it didn't do me any good. What do you think I did? It's pretty simple. I got in my car and drove down to the embassy. I went to the embassy of Yemen. And even had the money with me. Not that they forgot. I had the picture. And it was totally up to them. If they said, give this thing back, the cat was out of the bag. I couldn't say, well, I can't remember where I saw this. I forget now. And it was quite wonderful. He complained about George Bush for a while, talked about his daughter who was going to the University of Colorado in Boulder for a while. And then he said, what a great thing it is for Yemen to be celebrated in your museum. We invited him to the opening, so we kept it. It all came out just fine for now. For now. So this is what I'm working on now, right now. See this thing right here? That's Hebrew. It's wood. So in 1997, I get a phone call from a dentist in Miami. The dentist says, I have half of the Torah Ark shrine from the Ben Ezra Synagogue in Cairo. The Ben Ezra Synagogue in Old Cairo is the most famous synagogue in the medieval world. If you're Jewish, you know that Maimonides, the famous 12th century Sephardic philosopher, died in Old Cairo in 1204. He put his hand on this cabinet, opened it up, and took out the Torah and read in that synagogue. The synagogue was founded in 882 was in continuous use until the 20th century. It has a Geniza, which in Judaism is where you throw all the junk of your life because it might have the name of God on it. You don't want to destroy anything with the name of God. So the late 19th century, a scholar from Cambridge found 300,000 scraps of stuff, marriage contracts, shopping lists, literally the most vivid window onto life in the Middle Ages for Jews, Muslims, and Christians, for anybody, is in the Cairo Geniza, and they're still reading it right now. Famous, famous, famous. This is the guy, Barry Ragon. He lives in Miami. This is the door. Obviously, we bought it. I said, Barry, where did you get it? He said, I got it in Fort Lauderdale. What do you mean you got it in Fort Lauderdale? I got it at... <laughs> Trader's Paradise Auction on North Dixie. That's not Sotheby's. Or, uh, <laughs> Trader Auction Paradise in the 4,000 block of North Dixie in Fort Lauderdale. I said, Barry, how much you spent? He didn't tell me the first time. Only later did I find out that he spent $37.50. It's three feet tall and a foot, about a foot and a half wide. So he sent me a packet. He had carbon-14 dated it all by himself. I talked to Barry just yesterday, because this is what I'm writing about in my memoirs. The reason I'm writing about it is I have not still figured out how this, is, this was 11th century. 
It was seen in the synagogue, fully intact. See, it's busted a little bit. It's the right hand part of a cabinet, the left hand part and the top. We're all photographed together and reproduced in a little book by the Israel Museum in 1979. So he sent me this book with this picture in it. And then he sent me these, these little Polaroids of this scruffy little door that's all beaten up. And I says, where's the rest of it? He says, I have no idea. It wasn't on the floor of the auction place, Trader Paradise, on Dixie Highway like the other piece was. He went in on a Wednesday. It's the kind of auction place that, that they has bidding every Friday night. He went in on Wednesday. It was lying under some newspapers. That's what he tells me. Two and a half years later, he's on the phone. I'd worked my way up to $300,000. <laughs> I'm shrewd. If nothing else, I'm shrewd. I had a call from his brother. His brother said, the tension is too great. Part of Barry believes this thing is worth a million dollars. Part of Barry believes it's stolen. His wife is having real problems at home. I just learned this morning, Barry and his wife are separating. They're both in their 70s. Go figure. So I had a call from his brother the week before Thanksgiving, 14 years ago. He says, there's too much tension in the house. He's got to sell this thing. I was up to $300,000. He says, I says, I'll come down to Miami. I'll come down to South Beach and meet you. I stayed in one of those little deco hotels. It was a Friday after Thanksgiving, 1999. I'd never been to South Beach. I was dressed exactly like this. <laughs> exactly. They were having a white party. And that was when South Beach was totally gay. I was the only straight person in the whole town. The only person with pants on in the town. I was wearing a tie. The guy picks me up and we, we eat at an Israeli restaurant on, on Lincoln, sitting outside. For a long time, doesn't say anything. And finally, we start talking a little bit. And, okay, I'll, so I'll give you 330,000. He got up, shook hands. I think we got a deal. We had two disagreements, by the way. One was price, he wanted a million. I was gonna stop at 300, shrewd guy that I am knowing that he'd paid 37 and 50 for it. He had a pretty good cost basis for it. So I said to him, uh, look, I've been at this now for two and a half years. I've dealt with Ralph Lerner in New York. He had the fanciest lawyer he could possibly get, which didn't make any sense to me. I'd call the guy up, I'd hear these kids screaming in the background because he's drilling their teeth. You know, I knew he was a dentist, but he had three different phone numbers. He has the fanciest art lawyer in, in the world, Ralph Lerner in New York City. You, Ralph, how much does it cost to get a, you know, five minutes of this guy's time? What's a dentist going, getting a $37.50 door, selling it he wants for a million dollars, having the fanciest lawyer around, having three different phones, right? This doesn't add up. And I have this photograph of the whole thing intact. So I went down there, I said, okay, 3.30. I was buying with, by this time with Yeshiva University in New York, so every dollar I spent was 50 cents. I said, what the hell? You know, think big, it's the day after Thanksgiving. I showed up here, it's a white party, I gotta move in with the spirit of the moment. He got up to shake my hand, I says, okay, we got a deal. He said, well, I have to take it back to Barry. Barry doesn't have a brother. I still don't know who this guy was. I have no idea who he was. So I'll give you 10 days and then I'm out. Either this is the deal or it's not gonna happen with us. Nine days roll by, I had one of those cell phones that had the flip top, a Motorola. I was at our Christmas party for the Walters and I thought, well, hell, I'll find out what Barry's thinking. You know, nine days have gone by, he's got one more day, I said, Barry. And we had two disagreements, I told you that. One was price, the other one was how we're gonna handle the transaction. I had one final call to make. To whom was the final call to make? FBI. No. <laughs> <laughs> Th 
think back 18 minutes to the last time I asked you a question. Embassy. embassy. The Egyptian embassy. Now, do you think I'm going to go to the Egyptian embassy and say, well, I've got this piece of a synagogue. Think of that. You know, I didn't think I was going to get a whole lot of pushback, but nevertheless, I thought of this incredibly clever thing for which I didn't even get the advice of Ralph Lerner, the fancy lawyer at $800 or $1,200 an hour in New York. I says, I'll pay you the money. We'll put it in escrow, and it'll sit in escrow until I get clearance from the Egyptian embassy, at which time the escrow account will be released, and you'll walk out with $330,000. He didn't like that idea. He didn't like the idea that the money would be encumbered. So we had two disagreements. I made the offer of 330,000. The guy, whoever he is, I sent Barry an email this morning. I says, who was that guy that I met that had that SUV that picked me up at that little hotel that took me to the Israeli restaurant where I had fell awful? I mean, he's got to know who it was. So uh, I said, uh, I said to Barry, well, how are we? He says, well, I think you're right on the escrow thing. I think we can figure something out here. Why don't you just, we'll just have a verbal agreement and you send the certified letter to the Egyptian embassy with a 45-day clearance. Fine. So we got a deal. I'm looking at the the phone. Well, no, I want 500,000. The reason I told you it was a Motorola because at that point I went, 30 months of fooling around with this guy since my first phone call and the screaming kid. You never hang up on somebody. That's why you have agents when you buy a house, right? Somebody, you should never do that. The minute the phone closed, I had looked at it and I said, that was really stupid. So I went to another party that night and I was looking for anybody with a yamoka. It sounds stupid. But in fact, I needed somebody to carry my wallet. I needed somebody to make another phone call. I needed somebody who would get it. I didn't have to start 30 months back and explain everything about the door, about the synagogue, and all the rest of this stuff. I could just say, I'm offering $330,000 for the right-hand door of the Ben Ezra Synagogue Torah Ark Shrine. They'd go like that. Oh, boy, that's good. You should get that. I don't care if he paid $37.50. Get it. I needed somebody like that, and sure enough, I saw this big guy, Howard Friedman, with a yarmulke on, and, and as long as I, it took for me to tell you what I just said, he said, okay. He carried two phones with him. I'm standing there at a party with this guy. Same night, hour and a half has gone by. He calls him. Negotiations began. I said, Howard, any more money involved, you cover it. The guy's got more money than God. I figured, hell, he and Barry can figure it out. I don't need to know. Six weeks go by, Howard Friedman calls up and says, I got you a deal. He says, what is it? 390,000, 60,000. Great, are you covering the balance? No, I don't have any money. Okay, fine, 390,000, that's 195 each, right? Yeshiva and the Walters. Sent the letter off to the Egyptian embassy. It's the middle of March, 2000 by this time. Get a call from Barry's lawyer. He's got a new one now. He says, this thing has to be out by the end of the month. We have to close the deal by the 18th. I says, what? What's the hurry? He says, that's what the, my client says. We were buying it with somebody from Yeshiva. It was Passover. She's in Israel and can't be found. I had my 195000 Couldn't find her. Finally found her. Got the money together. Gave it to him. Has to be out of Miami by the end of the month. I says, why don't you fly it up? He says, my wife won't let me. I says, why? Because the plane will crash and you'll take your money back. <laughs> Maybe we would. I don't know. <laughs> so I says, okay, we'll get one of the art handlers. You know, they had these companies that drive around the countryside. Artex is what it's called. They'll come down and they'll get it. Called Artex. He says, yeah, we have one shipment going through Miami. It's on Saturday, the 28th. 28th of March. Great. We're done. Called Yeshiva up to Baltimore on the 28th, pause, Yeshiva University. You with me? There's a pause that says, no, can't do that. We can't move the door on Saturday. 
we got a shipment on the, on the Friday. So we got the door up, right? This opened at Yeshiva in the new gallery, 17th or 16th in Chelsea, 16th Street in Chelsea. And Mrs. Jesselson is there, and she was one that put up 195, and it was in Israel during Passover. And she's there, and we gave her a little talk, and we're out there, and it's in a glass case, and everybody's having some kosher wine, and it's all very sweet and nice. And at two occasions within a half an hour, two men over the age of 80 came up to me, independent of one another, and said exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. I know where the left-hand door is. <laughs> I says, yeah, well, that's fine. Why don't you just tell me? You know, and they just stood there. 15 minutes ago, the other guy came up. So we'll find out someday. I got one more vignette, and then I'm done. This is John Bourne. John Bourne's grandfather invented the Singer sewing machine as an electrified device for sewing. Uh, he was an opera singer, and the Clark family got bored with running the company. And so they hired him to be the CEO, and he said, let's put a motor on it, and they did. He made lots of money, and his son and his grandson never worked. This is John Bourne at the age of 22, who decides he's going to Chiapas, which he does, and he enjoys his self himself very much, and he starts buying the arts of ancient America. And he continued into his 80s to do the same thing. I met him in uh, Santa Fe in the year 2000. That's his house. It was built for Gene Hackman, designed by and built for Gene Hackman, and he lives in this house on a little dirt road north and west of Santa Fe, and the house is filled with the arts of uh, ancient Americans. October of 2008, I get a call from a friend of John Bourne, and he said, I intended to give this collection to the College of Santa Fe. You know, it's always an ill wind that does somebody some good. You remember the economic collapse of the fall of 2008? It hit the College of Santa Fe with a bang. They went bankrupt. On the 20th of May, 2009, I get a letter from John Bourne's lawyer the day that officially, the College of Santa Fe, to whom he had promised the collection. 420 works, went bankrupt, and he gave it to the Walters, plus $4 million, which wasn't a bad thing. Well, the only problem with all of that is it came uh, almost exactly to the month when all the rules changed about what you could and couldn't take, whether you talked to the Peruvian embassy or not. Uh, the code by which museums function has changed fundamentally. And if you don't have a paper trail back to 1970, it seems like a detail, but it's an important detail, the UNESCO Convention on Cultural Property, uh, they take, uh, you're not supposed to buy any art or accept any of it. Well, I was right in the middle. I've been working on this for eight years, and I decided I wasn't going to stop. So I accepted 420 works, yes, $4 million, and, uh, and one of my trustees came into me, and he says, you know, this guy has a whole, in fact, two chapters in Stealing History by Roger Atwood. I didn't even know that. You hate to get surprises like that. He found it on the internet. And sure enough, uh, this monkey head from Peru had been seized by the FBI, literally seized in a raid on a small museum. That's a call. It's the uh, Palace of Governors in Santa Fe. And they went to his house, they took the object, they couldn't prove it came from Peru. 18 months went by, he got it back. But he gets two chapters in Stealing History by Roger Atwood. So there we were right in the middle of it. I decided we're gonna take the whole collection and what we did was research and publish the collection, 420 works. And the big surprise was not that we gave this thing back to Peru. Uh, two years ago this weekend, uh, the Peruvian cultural attache came to the Walters and that was its little box in which he got it. He came with somebody from the FBI, uh, and I said, well, since you're here, I'll show you the rest of the Peruvian art that the guy's given us. So we took him into storage, into conservation, and showed them him all the things. And they're all on the internet. They're all freely accessible to anybody with everything we know about them. So if anybody makes a claim on it, 
So about two months later, I get a call from Roger, and he says, well, how about this piece? That's also from Peru. Why didn't you give it back? And he says, for a simple reason. It's a fake. Including this piece. You can kind of sense it by all the sharp edges there. It's like they were cut with a little old color, cut, almost the kind of things you can cut chickens with. Yeah, John Bourne was a recluse. He's got agoraphobia. He doesn't like to leave his house. He doesn't like anybody else to come into his house. So for 30 years, or his time in Santa Fe, he bought the house in 1992. So about for 20 years, nobody came into that house. No scholars saw it, no collectors saw it. So what John thought was Peruvian, was in fact modern, a quarter of the works were modern. And it was funny that this guy was gonna put me in the newspapers for taking a stolen work of Peruvian art. I says, well, that's fine. Do it if you want. So these are some adventures we've had in the course of trying to enlarge a collection, uh, scrapping with an Ethiopian pope, um, doing a very clever piece of finance with a dentist from Miami, and his brother who doesn't exist. I still can't figure that out. Thank you very much for... Uh,